Good evening. Standing before you tonight, I probably don't look very African to most of you. The reality is my family's been in Africa for over 300 years, so it would be a bit difficult for me to claim to be anything else. Unfortunately, it's one of those perceptions that exists that Africa looks a certain way, Africa sounds a certain way, and feels a certain way. In my job today, I have a day job, which is as a headhunter working for an international executive search firm called Odgers Bernson. And one of the things that we need to do is to convince some of the world's most senior executives, some of the most talented corporate leaders, to come to Africa and to run companies there. But as you can imagine, with the perceptions that people have of Africa, it's very often quite a difficult task to accomplish. Because the perception of Africa tends to be one that is very negative. It tends to be described by what I call the WWF view of the continent of Africa. That's not the World Wide Fund for Nature or the World Wildlife Fund as it used to be known. It's wildlife, war, and famine. And to that, you can probably add disease, and that's really what people think of when they think of Africa. But since 1989, since the end of the Cold War, the story of Africa really has changed. Yes, there are still many parts of the continent that are still going through quite negative phases. There's a lot of disease, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of war and unhappiness. But there's also a tremendous amount of the continent that is going on a very, very different path. And I talk about the Cold War because essentially the path that many of Africa's countries are undertaking at the moment started with the end of the Cold War. What happened was that the Cold War led Africa to be something of a chessboard for the ideological superpowers of the United States and the USSR. And when the Cold War ended, the guns and money that were propping up the ideological battles and civil wars across Africa dried up. And as a result, the civil wars came to an end in places like Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, and so many others. And as the civil wars ended, stability came and democracy started to take root. And when democracy took root, the IMF, the World Bank, and other institutions started looking at giving debt relief to Africa. Of course, that debt relief didn't come without any conditions. One of the conditions was that we needed to put in place sensible economic policies. And with that, we created a better business environment across many parts of the continent, and as a result, foreign direct investment has flowed into Africa over the last 20 years in a, at an unprecedented rate. So if you look at the total economic output across Africa, the total GDP in billions of US dollars, you can see that particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, those countries south of the Sahara Desert, we've seen a dramatic increase in total economic output across the continent. So as a result, the narrative around Africa is starting to change. What we're starting to see is a move from what you see on your left-hand side of the screen, the cover story of The Economist magazine in 2001, where they described Africa as the hopeless continent, to the cover story on the right-hand side of the screen, which is describing Africa as Africa rising, the same magazine 10 years later. And somewhere in between, what has started to change that narrative is a realization by organizations like the World Bank, that Africa is in a very similar space to what uh, China was 30 years ago and to what India was 20 years ago. So a very different picture that's starting to develop. In that same 2011 article, The Economist showed these two charts. The one on the left-hand side showing the 10 fastest growing economies in the world from 2001 to 2010. And if you look carefully, you will notice that there are six of the 10 fastest growing economies during that 10-year period in Africa. And then they forecasted 2011 to 2015, where they looked at the 10 fastest growing economies and found seven of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world being in Africa. So it's a different story. It's a growth story, and we're exper experiencing tremendous growth in many parts of the continent. Of course, unfortunately, the story that many people have around Africa's growth is that it's driven purely by resources. It's driven by the Norwegians coming and finding oil and gas. It's driven by the Chinese coming and digging holes in the ground to get out the gold and the platinum and the diamonds, and so on and so forth. And yes, that is very much where the growth cycle, the growth continuum has started. But remember that through years of civil war and through years of neglect, the infrastructure to get those resources to market and to ports has been destroyed. 
So there's a tremendous amount of inf uh, infrastructure investment that's going on to rebuild ports, rebuild roads, rebuild railways, and so on. And as that money flows into the economies across Africa, we're starting to see more money being spent on things like consumer goods, on telecommunications, particularly mobile telephones, housing and education, healthcare, services, banking, etc. And increasingly, money is being invested into manufacturing on the continent so that we're not just importing goods, we're actually making goods ourselves in our own continent. And just talking about the spending on consumer goods, I wanted to show you this picture, which is a photograph that I took in a ShopRite, which is a retail chain, a South African retail chain, in Lusaka in Zambia. ShopRite has spread to 16 different countries across the continent. I took this on a Friday afternoon to remind myself of two things. Firstly, never to go shopping at ShopRite on a Friday afternoon in Lusaka again. <laughs> and secondly, to remind myself of how a country that had little to no formal retail 10 to 15 years ago has what you see in this picture. A tremendous amount of buying power and people who really want to spend the money that they've got. This consumer power is going to increase and it's going to continue. What I have on the screen now is a series of uh, charts showing the different countries of the biggest populations in Africa. The bottom bar for each country is the population as it was estimated in 2010, and the top bar for each country is the population anticipated for 2050. And as you can see, countries like Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Tanzania, are expected to at least double their populations over the next 35 years. Now that's quite scary to a lot of people, the thought that we're going to end up going from one billion Africans today to two billion Africans by 2050, but keep in mind also that Africa is going to have the world's biggest work workforce by 2035, considering that almost half of Africa's population is currently under the age of 18. So a tremendous growth in buyers and of makers of goods and producers of services. So real possibility for ongoing growth and ongoing uh, movement into the future. Of course, it does come with its challenges. And one of the major challenges is Urbanization, as people are moving into the cities, keep in mind that Africa has the highest urbanization rate in the world, currently going from around 40% urbanized, expected to be about 60% urbanized by 2050. This is a picture taken in my hometown of Cape Town, and you can see that where I live in the distance up against the mountainside, we live a very comfortable life, but in the foreground of this picture, we have many people who live in tin shacks without electricity and without running water. That story is played out across the continent of Africa, and inequality is a very real issue that needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with quite decisively. In order to deal with it, of course, it takes government, and it takes strong government to be able to deal with that kind of uh, demographic change that's taking place. The good news on this is that democracy is undoubtedly spreading across Africa. So if you take into account that between 1960 and 1989, there were only five countries out of the 54 in Africa that we have today that had anything like regular democratic elections. And there was only one country between 1960 and 1989 that had a peaceful democratic transition of power, and that was the small island nation of Mauritius. Since 1990, we've had well over 30 governments and leaders change hands through a peaceful democratic process. So there's a fundamental shift in the belief in democracy across Africa. And as that belief in democracy changes, it will start to have a positive effect on things like the radicalism and fundamentalism that we're seeing today in places like Kenya and Nigeria. Of course, democracy is also very much helped by a lack of corruption or reduction in corruption. And Africa has a terrible reputation as being a, a tremendously corrupt continent across the board, wherever you happen to go. But if you look at this chart here, which is showing a list of some of the fastest growing economies in Africa, and it puts it up against Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Vietnam, those countries that we consider as countries that are definitely worth investing in because they are fast growing, you can see that our countries, countries like Rwanda, countries like Ghana, South Africa, are considered less corrupt than any of those other BRICS nations. And that's independently shown by the, uh, the Transparency International. So, again, it's about perception, 
and it's about a feeling that Africa has problems that other people don't have, and the reality is we're dealing with those problems and we're moving forward. In order to really move forward solidly, steadily, we have to be working on the issue of education. Without education, all of this growth is likely to peter out as soon as the process comes to an end. So if there was one thing that I would encourage you here in Norway and anyone else in the developed nations to focus on, if you were only to focus on one thing, I would say look at education and look at how you can assist with sustainable developments in education across Africa. There is, a, there is a movement happening as education is improving, particularly education of young girls across Africa. And as girls and boys become more and more educated, and they combine that education with a growth in telecommunications, particularly mobile telecommunications, on this chart you can see the growth that has taken place in access to mobile telecommunic telecommunications across Africa over the last 15 years, 30% compound annual growth rate, it means that more educated people and more connected people can increasingly become more globally competitive and start that internal sustainability spreading out into the rest of the world and doing very much what India and China have been seen to do over the last 20 to 30 years. So my basic message that I want to leave with you today is Africa is going through a wave of change. Africa is not the perception that we all have and have had for so long of a basket case, of a place where we've got to send our old clothes and our food and all of that sort of thing because Africans can't look after themselves. It's a wave that started 20 years ago and is going to continue over the next 20 to 30 years. So how do you avoid missing the wave and allowing China and Australia and various other players around the world becoming the people that benefit from that wave how do you avoid getting left behind? I think there are essentially three things that you need to do. First of all, I would strongly encourage developing a much more nuanced view of Africa. It's a massive continent. It's very diverse. It's very different from place to place. Don't think of it as a country. Think of it as a collection of 54 countries, all very different from each other. Understand the differences between them and start to look at how can you benefit how can you get involved in the growth where it's happening in the way that it happens best in each different place? The second point is to partner with Africans. Partner with us. Come and talk to us. Don't come and tell us what we should be doing and telling us how the world should be working. Come and work with us on the ground. We understand the place. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. And if you partner with us, you can really benefit from being a part of that growth story. And thirdly, if you feel the need to give, if you feel the need to be involved in charity, please focus on something that will develop sustainable change across the continent, things like education. But what I would strongly encourage is rather than aid, go for trade. Please come and do business with us. Please come and look at what we have to offer. Come and bring your services and goods to us to help us develop ourselves as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I've been able to give you an idea of why I believe that the history, the historical view of Africa is a very different story to the view that we have going forward, that we actually have a bright future for Africa. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming you to Africa. Thank you.